This episode is brought to you by BitMEX, the OG crypto exchange that is back and better than ever. You'll hear more about BitMEX later in the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Empire. Today's weekly roundup, we are joined by Mr. Byron. Uh, Byron, I still, you've been here at Blockworks since September. I call you Mr. Byron. I don't actually know how to pronounce your last name. Gilliam, Gilliam. Uh, he is the Matt Levine of crypto. He is the idol of your inbox. He is a crypto connoisseur. Mr. Byron, welcome to the show. Thanks. You want to tell us how to uh, pronounce the last name? Is it Gil- Gilliam? Uh, the family calls it, goes by Gilliam, but I generally say Gilliam to anyone who might have to spell it. So either way works. Gil, isn't there an I at the end of it though? Gilliam? There's, a, there's an I, there's two I's in it. Silent I though, huh? There's a silent I. I think it's a, uh, a Scottish pronunciation. Yeah. By the way, however your family pronounces your last name, I think is the real pronunciation. I don't think it should be uh, anyone. I don't think anyone else dictates how you pronounce your last name. <laughs> Uh, Byron, all right, so there's a lot to talk about today. I want to cover OpenSea, um, just the DOJ, uh, DOJ charges against Nate. I want to talk about the Optimism airdrop. Um, curious to get your take on just VC private market ARB that's happening right now. Um, Arthur Hayes wrote an interesting piece. I'm curious to get your take on. I don't know if you read that yet. Uh, maybe get some last final thoughts on Terra Luna. Um, but before we do that, you joined Blockworks September first, September 5th, 7th, somewhere early September. Uh, the market was riding high. We had like two or three more months of the bull run. Everything was working. And I just remember when you joined, like you really threw yourself into crypto. Uh, and now it's like nine months later and things haven't been going so well for the last six months. And maybe some of these things in DeFi that you were super excited about, maybe you're just seeing that like, uh, you're maybe you're, you're a little less optimistic about them. So I would love to get your thoughts on how the last three or four or five months have been for you uh just in your journey into crypto yeah i mean first off i want to apologize to everybody for causing the top uh uh, you know if i thought leaving crypto would reverse it i would do it i would i would take the you know i would i would take the charge for everybody but I, i don't think it works that way so i'm not going to um but yeah it's it's been interesting i think uh i i I, I think that you're probably your long term view is in many ways conditioned by your first like six months in the in the industry. Uh, and I'm a major victim of, you know, recency bias and things like that. So uh, I am getting a little bit bearish, but that's probably excellent news because I, you know, historically, I'm always bearish at the bottom. It's not going to be a bottom unless I'm bearish. So I think that's I think that's good news for everybody. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's been uh, it's it's been really interesting. I'm not even sure where to start. Like I came into it looking for lottery tickets. Like I was going to find the next Solana and I was going to put a thousand dollars into it and it was going to go up eight thousand times and I was going to be rich. I've given up doing that. I don't think that there are a lot of lottery tickets around. Um, I I thought that I was going to stumble on all kinds of amazing. Uh, undiscovered investments that were going to be the next Nike or Microsoft or something, but I don't. I've kind of stopped doing that. Also, I don't think that's what crypto is about. I, I entered it kind of thinking that cryptos were basically tech stocks. You know, they're they're software. So I kind of thought cryptocurrencies were going to be like higher beta tech stocks, um, but I, I don't think that that's what they are anymore. Um, I think my major takeaway at the moment is that uh, I'm not totally convinced that crypto is an investable asset class. It's definitely a tradable asset class, um, but I'm increasingly looking at it more like a, you know, commodities and not equities, you know, like commodities kind of have, uh, I mean, equities kind of have a a natural upward bias um, because, you know, companies get more productive over time, they generate cash flow, they buy back stock, they pay dividends, they benefit from inflation, um, you know, so even if they're not going up in real terms, they're probably going up in nominal terms. Uh, but that is not the case with cryptos, right? Like uh, cryptos are uh, certainly at the moment, they're, you know, as a whole, they're not generating, um, they're not generating cash flow They're, uh, you know, they're consuming cash flow. Um, they, I'm not sure that they get more productive over time. You know, so all those, all those biases that, that kind of bail you out in equities, I'm not sure that they exist in crypto. So I'm more looking at, at them now, like 
copper or something like that or the Swiss franc or something. They're, they're, I, I'm looking at them more like commodities or currencies than, than equities. Hmm. That's really interesting. I mean, I think there would be maybe I would have two pushbacks on that. One is uh, the overused analogy of looking at the early dot com days is none of those were investable companies, except for maybe the five or 10 that were um, the Amazons and Googles that came out of that era. Uh, and then, you know, several years later, obviously, Facebook and Snapchat and, and Instagram and things like that. So one question I would have for you and the second pushback might be that there are uh, revenue producing protocols and, and projects, uh, specifically in DeFi, um, something like a, uh, an Aave or a Maker, like they do spit off cash flows. The cash flows obviously look a little different because they're, well, we can get, get to that in a second. But um, when you think about whether or not that, does, does this change basically? Like, are we just too early in crypto? Um, and it just looks something like investing in, in the internet in 1998, 1999, 2000? Or does this feel like a byproduct of just how, how these projects and how the, how the industry is set up? Yeah, at, at the moment, I think it's the latter. But, you know, I reserve the right to change my opinion before this podcast is over even. Um, but I guess I have two structural concerns. Um, one is that, I, uh, you know, the, the mega winners in, in equities are a function of two basic things, I think. One is that they create a moat around a business and then they can just extract profits uh, from inside their castle forever, right? Um, and two is that they have... Uh, they almost always have some singular leader in the beginning, you know, a founder or whomever who is taking giant risks. And then the giant, you know, for some of them, the giant risks pay off like, you know, Bezos or Phil Knight or whatever. And neither of those things are true in crypto. You know, crypto is is open source. Right. <clears throat> um, so it's. I think it's very difficult to build a moat. Like I think Uniswap has a little bit of a moat because everyone just goes there, even like even though they could go to one inch or whatever. But the the moats are going to be you know shallow in crypto. Uh, I think which is going to make it very difficult to extract rents, which is great. I mean that's you know that's what that is a massive feature and not a flaw of crypto, but it's great for users and not necessarily investors. Um, and then the other thing is that if um, you know, cryptos are really going to be DAOs, then they're not going to have that singular founder leader making giant risky decisions all the time, right? Like you are just not, you know, if if you have to take a, a, a vote of the entire DAO for every major or minor decision, you are just not going to take the risks that Jeff Bezos took or Phil Knight took or, or whomever. Um, so for those two reasons, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical that crypto is going to, to produce those giant winners for investors. I still think that amazing things are going to be built. I just don't think that you are going to get the returns out of them like you would do in, in equities. Tell me more about that founder one. Um, why is so someone like Hayden at Uniswap or Stani at Aave, why are they not going to take the risks? But someone like Bezos or Phil Knight would would take the risks because they've already made a bunch of money because their equity is liquid earlier on. Is that the thesis? No, I guess I guess I'm thinking more of a uh, of kind of an idealized DAO where the decision making is is genuinely decentralized. Um, so yes, early on, um, mm. uh, certainly when you know before a token is listed and when you know just VC investments or whatever, those those you know in those situations, people can still take take the big risks. I don't know enough about like the decision making at, at Ave or, or something like that. Um, uh, but, you know, if we don't want cryptos to be securities, then they're going to have to be decentralized. And if they are decentralized, uh, they are not going to be risk taking, I don't think. So there are moats in crypto. They're just not the traditional moats that you see. I think the traditional the one of the strongest moats in um, in like web in I think there's two different kinds of moats, like one moat in TradFi is just the shittiness of the product makes it very tough to switch over. So like uh, leaving my Bank of America or Wells Fargo account, it's just like, I just know the headache that it comes with it is going to be a total pain in the ass. So that's almost like their moat, like Bank of America uh, checking versus like Ally Bank checking versus Wells Fargo versus JP Morgan versus like Goldman checking. And they're all the same. It's the same product, right? So you could probably argue that like the brand is actually the moat there um, because it's the exact same product. So the brand is the moat that 
or the brand probably gets you in and like it's marketing and then like the shittiness of the product is almost the moat uh, and maybe in web too the the moat is just that you build in at least in social media the moat is that you actually build this massive audience that you don't own so like i have built a big audience on twitter but not on instagram uh, and so I'm not going to port over, like, there's no way to port over my Twitter. So you don't think that those moats, do you think any sort of moats in, exist in crypto? That's just like, there's less of a moat? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, you know, as you said at the top, I've only been in here since September. So I'm just I'm very <laughs> much trying to trying to figure things out. Fair. And, you know, the you know, as you know, the newsletter I write is basically just me figuring things out from a from a trad five perspective. So I'm, I'm, Pretty confident that the moats are, you know, lower in in crypto than than in TradFi, and that is good. That's definitely a feature and not a yeah, flaw. Yeah, it's good for the user. Maybe bad for um, the company. Yeah, I do think there are some moats, like I said, with like like Uniswap and like OpenSea seems to have a moat for some reason. Like they've you know they've seen off looks rare pretty well so far, um, but you know if it's open source software that can be copied and forked and vampired uh, I just I, I don't think you were ever going to be able to take 80% margins like you're a SaaS company right like crypto is not ever going to let you take 80% margins I don't think um, which is great if you're a user uh, but it's it's not great if you're an investor yeah I want to touch on one thing that you said before getting into any of like this week's news which is you are you're not looking for the these like 100x outlier winners like you're not trying to find the solanas anymore what's the second order thing of that you're not finding these so that you are instead you are placing your money with what the 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 blue the quote unquote blue chips like instead of trying to throw 20 little small bets on like the next 100xers you're just kind of putting your money into like uniswap ave these kind of like blue chip DeFi projects you're putting it into back into like the l1s um where, what does that mean that you're not actually putting your money into these like next hundred Xers? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, at the moment, I I don't have anything that I'm like high conviction on. Uh, so I can't really say where I'm putting my money. Man, I've, first of all, I've lost most of my crypto money. So there's not a lot of it <laughs> to put anywhere. Um, but I think uh, like, uh, you know, one thing that I, 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 like generally I'm looking for more, tactical things um you know what is you know what is you know what's going to do well over the next two or three months instead of lottery tickets where it's all or nothing you know hold it for five years and either you're rich or you're a zero um but the problem with that i haven't done much of that tactical stuff now because it's like really time consuming <laughs> you have to you have to be like, I don't, I don't know how people have time for it, really. Um, like, I think there's loads of interesting things happening in, happening in the curve wars and, and stuff like that. And I think that if you, you know, spent the time truly understanding the tokenomics, then, you know, you can have an opinion on uh, FXS right now uh, or, you know, uh, vote locked uh, curve or whatever. Um, but that's like... It is a massive time commitment. Um, and so, you know, at the moment, I haven't really been been trading very much. Yeah. It feels like one of the um, the best arbitrages in crypto over the last two years has been betting on early stage companies because there was a massive amount of exit liquidity uh, from retail. So a lot of the, the, the early stage venture space just got so overheated and so insane because it was re honestly really hard to lose money. If you're doing any sort of angel investing or early stage investing uh, in companies that eventually converted equity into a token and had a SAFT. Uh, as soon as that SAFT went live, uh, as, as soon as the equity got converted to a token, the token went live on some, some exchanges. Uh, you basically exited to a bunch of retail who would buy up your token. Uh, it feels like that arbitrage is going away as, um, and it feels like actually there's, things have flipped. A, because there's like not that retail demand to soak up that exit liquidity, but B, um, it just feels like the private markets have got so overheated, like layer zero raising at a $3 billion valuation um, when there are some like pretty solid other bridging companies that are public and have tokens that are like so, so, so undervalued, um, at least relative to the 3 billion. So do you think that things are flipping? Um, and do you think that like the public, it, it, the, whereas the last two years, everything was so focused on the private markets, are we going to a world where maybe a lot of the opportunities exist now in the public markets? 
Uh, that would be great if that's the case. Um, I uh, I would say that you know the first thing that happen, has to happen is that the private market valuations have to come lower. <laughs> you know, I'm not <laughs> sure that you know those are too high. I'm not sure that that means that the public valuations are too low. I so far have not found anything where I think like, wow, that is really cheap. <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah. probably because I'm coming from a trad five perspective and I'm trying to figure it out on traditional metrics like you know, earnings and earnings multiples and things. Um, it's got, which is kind of confusing to me because it, it seems like on the one hand, crypto has like a, a very limited pool of buyers, right? There are just, there are not that many people who are in crypto. And it seems like the, you know, the same money gets recycled around from, from one thing to the other. But on the other hand, uh, the valuations of, listed tokens to the degree that valuation makes sense in crypto seems really high to me <laughs> you know like I like I think maker on like on token terminal maker trades on like 15 times earnings which is the same as 15 times sales in crypto which is like I mean that doesn't seem like it's screamingly cheap right um, so I don't I you know I think it's good that if private valuations come lower but I I don't think that that means that public valuations are a super bargain at the moment. At least, not that I found. I would, I would love to find some that are. Yeah. Um, let's go into some of the news from the week. So, where do you want to start? You want to start Optimism or OpenSea? Uh, I don't know. OpenSea, I think, is is ridiculous. <laughs> like, uh, I, I think I read that the the person whose name I've forgotten did he get sentenced to okay, a so year? Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you a little overview. So basically. A couple months ago, um, this guy, uh, this guy Nate Chastain, who was a product manager at OpenSea, was accused in uh, actually when you joined Blockworks, I think it was in September of 2021, of secretly buying uh, four, I think it was 45 NFTs based on confidential information that he knew as a PM uh, that they would soon be featured on OpenSea's homepage. So basically, he was a PM. He knew that these NFTs would get listed on the homepage of OpenSea, which just like getting listed on Coinbase pumps the price of something. It's kind of like the, the NFT version of like a new asset listing on Coinbase. Um, and then he would flip those for an easy profit. Um, OpenSea CEO Devin Fincer came out and said, I do, I do think that there was a misframing of it as insider trading. We don't view NFTs as financial assets, so that does not apply. That's a very specific term for a very specific thing. So that was Devin Fincer, the CEO of OpenSea's take back in September. This past Wednesday, uh, we're recording this Thursday afternoon. So yesterday, Nate was arrested for wire fraud and money laundering related to insider trading. Um, what, are you, what are your take? What's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, I think, oh, important, I think important to note, this was, I think, the first insider trading case in crypto or maybe just the first insider trading case in NFTs. So. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think insider trading is a subset of fraud. So I think saying that it's not a financial product is not going to get you out of it. Um, like you know, I think it's just considered fraud. Like the buyer has defrauded the seller of their rightful profits, uh, which I think is ridiculous. Um, you know, like who is the victim here? Really, like the the person who wanted to sell their on-chain receipt for a JPEG, they are they have been defrauded because they didn't get to sell it after it was listed on OpenSea. Like that seems like a very tenuous thing, uh, you know. And if you're talking about equities, if somebody is somebody's insider trading a stock, then and you know you can make the case that they are. Uh, they are making markets less efficient and, uh, you know, markets have a purpose, which is to allocate uh, uh, capital to the economy. And therefore, in some way, the economy has gotten slightly less productive. You know, if you're talking about flipping NFTs, I, I don't know, like, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what the disbenefit of that is. Um, I also think that, like, surely the FBI has better things to do than police NFT trading. I can't believe that they pay any attention to this, which makes me like a little bit concerned. Like maybe this is the thin end, end edge of the wedge to to crack down on all of crypto because like why why do they care? You know, to me it's more like like 
if they were policing like in-game, you know, the trading of in-game items in a video game or something like that. Uh, that to me is more akin to NFT. That would, you know, that's more what NFT trading is than than trading equities. Um, and I think I also read that the guy was sentenced to a year in prison. Is that correct? I think it's longer. I think it's much longer. I mean, if it's actually if it actually goes through, I think it's much longer. Than I that. mean, that is unconscionable to me. Like that just seems totally insane. <laughs> like how is this? Uh, which he is. Uh, he is charged. Carries a maximum sentence of twenty years in prison. Has he has he been sentenced? No, I don't think so. I, I mean, that's just I can't understand that at all. <laughs> that's just yeah. that's just totally crazy. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, this is actually, I'm reading the justice.gov. I'm reading the press release from the Department of Justice, uh, the Southern District of New York. Chastain, 31, of New York. New York is charged with one count of wire fraud and one count of money laundering, each of which, oh, each of which carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. So up to 40 years in prison. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I don't I know. Mean, like, there's no, I mean, there's... <laughs> No scenario in which flipping JPEGs should get you, you know, removed from society. That's just it is just not that important. And I mean, the guy, the poor guy, the guy is clearly. I mean, he's lost his job. Obviously, he's he's you know been humiliated. I would say that he's he's already served his time. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I certainly think that OpenSea should be policing this uh, because it is you know repu- reputational damage to them. But I do not see why the FBI needs to get involved, and I certainly don't see why what anyone should have to be in prison. Yeah, yeah. I think there are a couple of thoughts here. One is companies are going to this is uh, it sets the precedent for companies are going to have to do a much better job of actually policing this internally. So any and basically any marketplace business is going to have to do a better job here. Uh, obviously, Coinbase, the Coinbase pump, right? When an asset gets listed um, on Coinbase, it's been I think they've actually taken pretty strong measures to uh, to fix this over the last several months. But um, back in like 2017, 2018, 2019, it was pretty standard for like the price of an asset to really pump before the asset actually got announced that it was getting listed on Coinbase. And it was, and it was really just Coinbase employees who were pumping it. My, uh, my impression from reading things, and this is mostly Twitter, and everything on Twitter is true, so it's definitely correct. Um, my, my impression is that most of that was a function of like people scouring Coinbase's GitHub page and looking yeah, at yeah. like test nets and things like that, which is not insider trading. That's, that's uh, you know, public that information. Is, it's no different than, you know, uh, hedge funds buying data that sh- like uh, hedge funds buying data that shows like how many people were shopping at Walmart last year, like how like aerial except footage. Don't, except, uh, you don't even have, except you don't even have to buy it. It's free if you're clever enough to figure it out. Like I, Right. I mean, or you I, look I, on I, Google I, Maps I, every three months when they take the screenshot of the Walmart parking lot and you can see if it's full or not. So, uh, okay. So what for, uh, first, first implication, I think exchanges, uh, like Coinbase, like OpenSea are going to have to take much stronger measures to make sure there isn't insider trading on their platform. Um, I think that this is probably also the first domino. Um, I think the regulators are just trying to make an example of Nate here. Uh, it's a completely bullshit case in my mind, but this is them just making, um, putting their foot down and saying like, look, we're coming after, we're coming after crypto. And I think a lot of folks in the industry had always said crypto isn't a security therefore it can't be regulated uh therefore insider trading can't be regulated and this clearly shows uh that that was one of the biggest misconceptions i think yeah that's not correct you know it does not does not have does not have to be a security i think that is one of the biggest misconceptions in the industry is that insider trading does not just apply to securities um, which is really important for folks to know so, yeah you got to feel for nate feel bad for the guy uh, optimism. Here's what happened with optimism. Um, we talked about optimism a couple of weeks on, uh, weeks ago on the podcast with Santiago, basically optimism deployed, uh, 5% of their OP token contract, uh, before they made, so that uh, optimism was releasing these tokens. They did an airdrop. Uh, what they made, they had a little hiccup this week though, which is before they made, uh, they deployed the token contract before they made the airdrop announcement. Uh, some new, some users noticed this before the announcement. They started claiming their tokens. Optimism then tried to scramble to fix this. They launched uh, a claims UI and made an announcement. Um, this kind of just like the the hoopla around this uh, kind of overwhelmed Optimism's RPC endpoint, and a lot of users experienced like failed claims for the next several hours. Um, 
what happened here, here, I'm going to pull this up. Basically the community, um, what happened after, so they had about 250,000 eligible wallets. Um, but there's this new proposal by a community member member to ban anyone who sold their airdrop tokens from future airdrops. Um, I'm not sure. Did you see this? Did you see this proposal? Yeah, I love that. I think it's great. Yeah. What, what do you think? Well, I mean, in, uh, you know, coming from TradFi, uh, you know, the thing that always happens is, uh, you know, when there's a hot IPO, every big account puts in for, you know, 10 times the amount that they actually want. Uh, and then, you know, whatever they get for their allocation, they just immediately sell it. Right. And everybody knows it happens, but you can't prove it. So, you know. Every you know every account will say yeah yeah we love this stock we want as much we want as much of it as we can so we can so we can keep it forever and then they you know they sell it on the opening price um, so I think it's totally you know that's this is this speaks well to crypto that you can actually see exactly what's happening you know and you can and and you can hard code it you know you could you could hard code rules to to prevent it I don't I don't really think that you should but I think it's I think it's really cool that you can. Yeah. Can you explain that to us? What is, what does that look like when let's say Goldman's taking a company public? Yeah, if there's a hot, you know, if there's a hot IPO, which there hasn't been many lately. So, you know, if what whatever, you know, Facebook at the time or whatever, um, you know, a lot of times everybody knows it's going to be up 20, 30, 50%. Um, so the the biggest accounts will put in for, you know, many more times than what they actually want. And they will get an allocation to the IPO in theory, because, uh, you know, they're going to be a good long term shareholder. But in reality, they get the allocation because they are good customers of Goldman Sachs or whomever. Um, so, you know, Goldman Sachs's best customers will get the biggest allocations to the Goldman Sachs IPOs. And some of them will genuinely want to be long-term holders, but um, on the hot ones, typically they just sell on the first day, and they just you know it's just free money for them. Um, and this is you know this is the same exact thing, except that you know you can see what everyone's doing, and you can't see that in TradFi. You know, in TradFi, Goldman uh, you know issues the IPO to whatever whatever to you know whatever big account, and the big account sells it with Morgan Stanley. So Goldman Sachs has no idea what they've done. You know. Uh, but in crypto, you get to see exactly what everybody's done, which is amazing. Empire is brought to you by BitMEX. With the launch of their spot exchange, BitMEX is running an insane promo right now. We wanted to give you the inside scoop. Here's the deal. For the next two months, users who trade $250 worth of crypto on BitMEX's spot exchange will be entered into their million dollar giveaway. Prizes range from thousands of dollars all the way up to $500 thousand dollars that's right trade 250 bucks on bitmex for a chance to personally win five hundred thousand dollars beyond the million dollar giveaway new users can also get up to 200 bmex bmex that's bitmex's new token coming soon just by creating an account and going through kyc and trading so you can actually get bitmex tokens just by creating an account and trading the more you trade the higher your chances of winning what are you waiting for? Go to bitmex.com today. Sign up for an account, bitmex.com. Uh, I thought this was the funniest proposal. I think it was such a silly proposal. Um, I think what happened is their token fell like, I don't know the updated price, probably fell 50 or 60%. It might be a little more than that. I haven't checked the price in a little while. It fell like 50 or 60%, uh, which obviously caused some people in the community to say, get all mad and riled up that, uh, so, that people are selling their tokens. Um, and what they were discussing is like barring anyone who dumped their tokens from future airdrops, which um, Mike wrote about this actually in the Memorial Day newsletter. I don't know if you read that, his piece, but it's like, there's this thought in crypto that you should just be rewarded because you were early. And it's kind of a silly thought, right? It's kind of a silly thought that like, you didn't really do much work, but because you're early, um, you should get rewarded. And um that's just not really how it exists in traditional in traditional financial markets and and for good reason right imagine i think the example that mike used is like imagine if series a investors when the company was raising a series b they were like give me more tokens give me excuse me give me more equity give me more a larger allocation here we're not going to pay you any money but we deserve more equity because we were early uh, and it's just this like because we were early that exists in crypto that doesn't really exist anywhere else 
um, for good reason, because if you have to either put in work or put in capital to get equity. Um, and so this just feels like Optimism's community, or not all of them, one or a couple of folks, uh, getting pretty mad that uh, the, the price of their token went down and uh, that these early people were, were dumping. Well, but I, mean, I, mean, I think there is a, uh, a use case for bootstrapping usage by you know, rewarding, you know, incentivizing usage with tokens. I think that, I think that makes sense. Um, like with looks rare or something, I think, you know, it has to be well designed. Um, and it's not, you know, we've learned over the last year that it's not easy. Um, uh, but I think there's, I think there's a, I think there's a legitimate use case for, for rewarding early users. Um, and I also think that like, I agree that this proposal is kind of silly and, uh, Kobe's either response to the approval or his own proposal was absolutely hilarious. So it was so funny. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there are uh, this is there are these types of things in crypto that don't ex- exist in TradFi, which I think would which would be in, you know an advantage to crypto. Like you know you could uh, you know in TradFi everyone gets the same dividend, but in crypto you can lock up your tokens for a year and the people who lock them up get a higher dividend. Like that's why not do that? <laughs> you know, I think, you know, TradFi CEOs would love to be able to uh, incentivize longer term um, uh, uh, holders. You know, the, the probably the most consistent number one complaint about American capitalism is short termism. Um, right. And, the, you know, this would be, you know, if TradFi companies could do what you can do in crypto, that could totally address that. You could you could incentivize longer term holders uh, to the disbenefit of shorter term holders. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't dismiss it. I think there's something there. It just has to be like really thoughtful and well designed. I think so. So I agree. There is something there, and you should benefit early users. It's more. I think it's more the mentality around airdrops that's kind of frustrating to me. So I remember when the, when the Uniswap airdrop happened. There was not a single user who complained when that happened. Like it was happiness all around. Mm-hmm. Everyone's making money. Everyone's all happy. And that just like set the standard for airdrops. Now what's happened with airdrops is um, they feel very like gamed. And it feels like these like sophisticated users have a clear advantage and everyone's trying to play the airdrop game. Yeah. And um, people are people get upset if like the price of the token goes down. I guess kind of like when the when an IPO happens and, and the price of it goes down, people are pe- people are upset. But like I don't know. We saw Juno maybe a month or two ago. They confiscated $35 million in tokens from a whale who they thought gamed the airdrop. Now you have the optimism community uh, discussing like punishing sellers. Um, I don't know. It just feels like take your tokens and be happy um, and do things that reward. Yeah, that that accrue value. Uh, surprise airdrops are, I think, probably should not be a thing anymore. And even retrospective airdrops probably should not be a thing anymore. But I think you could, you know, design a thoughtful airdrop where you just like lay out exactly the behavior that will get the next 5% of an airdrop or something, right? And, you know, kind of pinpoint the the usage that you're aiming for. I think it seems like that would be uh, doable and useful. Yeah. Have you read? Have you read anything around like layer ones as public goods? Uh, a little bit, not not very much. Um, you could make the argument that some of these like layer ones are public goods, or that something like optimism is a public good, and that they like didn't really have a monetization strategy at launch. Um, and I think the comparison here could be something like Twitter. Like Twitter is basically just a public good. It didn't really have a monetization strategy, and then they tried finding monetization early, um, or uh, excuse me, later. It feels like that's maybe what some companies are doing right now, like some layer twos by saying like, it really is almost like a layer, it really is almost like a public good. And then they're trying to find monetization or, uh, later by just launching a token. Yeah, I don't, I don't totally understand why layer twos should have tokens. Um, and I correct, correct like my, my thought was that it's kind of like layers two are kind of like a WeWork thing, like they buy they buy block space on the layer one and then they resell it at layer two. And, you know, maybe the way to monetize that is by taking a little tiny spread between, you know, buying it on layer one and selling it at layer two. Um, I don't think that's the case with optimism, right? Because the, because it's denominated in ETH, I think the benefit goes back to Ethereum. I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't know the details. Um, so I could see, I mean, I, I could see where layer twos would be monetizable, um, but it does not seem like a great, business to me again like this is 
not these are not going to be software companies with 80 percent margins right like the the layer two that's going to win i'm assuming if it has a profit margin it's going to be razor thin it's going to be like thin enough that nobody else can be bothered to fork it right yeah yeah i think what the skeptic would say is that um the op token is basically just exit liquidity for insiders and vcs um and that like something like op and you could even argue like other layer one tokens, like even ETH, like there's not really a clear value accrual system there. Um, but I mean, I think there is like for layer twos, there is a first mover advantage, right? Like if you if you collect a lot of liquidity on your layer two, then other people are going to want to be on your layer two, right? So if you can. But that's a disconnect. That's the, that's separate. That's you're separating the network from the token there. That's like. Well, but if you're I'm just saying if you can use the token to incentivize usage, then that might have real long-term value. Um, I'm not like, that is not a token that I want, would want to buy, <laughs> um, but I could see where I could see why they would, would do it. And I could see why long-term that might be the best thing for the protocol. Yeah. By the way, uh, I'm a huge fan of optimism and I just, I'm trying to play devil's advocate to a lot of this. Uh, Santiago and I did an episode kind of about the, uh, Optimism token release when they announced that they were going to do this a couple of weeks ago. So you guys should go listen to that, which is a little more optimistic about optimism. So um, anything else on optimism you want to touch on here? That is the full extent of what I know about optimism. I do not know. I do not even know enough of it to be expressing an opinion, really. So <laughs> Good. that's why we bring you on here, Byron, to <laughs> uh, talk about things that we have uh, no, no real clear uh, guidance on. Um, one thing I, want, I do want to get your take on is... Uh, that touches maybe the traditional financial world a little more than, than optimism launching a token is partnerships between miners uh, and oil companies. So Exxon, uh, ConocoPhillips, Marathon Oil, and some other oil companies are running pilots with BTC miners to use what otherwise would have been wasted gas from oil wells uh, to power Bitcoin mining operations. Um, do these new partnerships change the narrative around like Bitcoin as bad energy, uh, as a, as a dirty form of energy. Do these, does like, does clean Bitcoin play into this? What, what are your, actually just zooming out, like what are your thoughts on a lot of these, um, the Exxons and the Exxon Mobiles of the world and the big oil companies, oil and gas companies starting to get into bed with the Bitcoin miners and starting to Bitcoin mine? Yeah, I mean, from a crypto perspective, I think that, you know, if we're hoping to benefit from a, you know, have a, a benefit from teaming up with the oil industry, then I think we're kind of in a bad place. You know, like they're not, uh, you know, the oil industry is not anybody's favorite either. <laughs> so I, that, I'm not like super hopeful about that. Uh, I'm also not hopeful that anyone is really going to understand the nuance of Bitcoin being generated with, uh, you know, f waste natural gas or, you know, some some form of energy that was going to be wasted and is therefore, you know, a zero cost. Um, I do think the reality of it is that it's super valuable. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, it could, in fact, accelerate the transition to uh, renewable energy because it's going to, you know, a renewable energy product that can mine Bitcoin for free on the side is going to be, uh, you know, easier to start up and cheaper to finance than one that isn't. Uh, so I think there's a real substantial argument to say that Bitcoin could become a net positive for the environment. Uh, but there's like one that is super hard to quantify. I don't know how you quantify that. And two, that is like such a nuanced argument that and the and the case against Bitcoin is so deeply entrenched that I'm, I'm not super optimistic that that narrative is going to take hold. Yeah, I would have to agree with you. I want to get your take on a couple more things before we wrap this up. You tweeted a week ago, DeFi's killer use case, front running. <laughs> Tell <laughs> me more about was, this. That was a little clickbaity, I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got some retweets. You, uh, your Twitter is kind of booming these days. Uh, at B... <laughs> 
G I L L I A M, nineteen eighty two. I love that. Not, not, a, not a not a catchy handle, but I wasn't that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I wasn't really thinking about having a following when I signed up. But the benefit <laughs> of that is that people think I was born in nineteen eighty two, which that is not my birth year, but people think it is. So I'm not gonna. I'm not what's gonna the what's them. what's nineteen eighty two from? Uh, I before I quit drinking, I was a large fan of uh, French red wines, and nineteen eighty two is the all time greatest year in French red wines. <laughs> Interesting. Did you make the Twitter when you were? Uh, uh, when you were drinking nice French red, red wines, uh, it's very possible there was a high whatever you know, it, whatever whatever time it was, there was a high probability that I was drinking a glass of French red wine. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, DeFi's killer use case, front running. <laughs> uh, I'm forgetting what that was in response to. I think that was oh, was that that was the I think Wireless was, Anon tweeted the real bull case for DeFi apps becoming their own interoperable right. app specific L ones is right. to capture the value created by protocol MEV. Few understand this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If I mean, if the whole industry is going to be based on MEV, then I, I you know, I, I think that's a sorry state of affairs because, you know, MEV is essentially front running. Right. Is there is there a better way to look at MEV? You know, it's, it's reordering transactions to to the validator or miners benefit, which to me is just front running. And that's totally fine if that's what you have to do to to secure the blockchain. That's totally fine. But that surely cannot be you know the the one thing that the entire industry is 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 built on i hope is there a way to prevent this uh the way to prevent this is to to uh create better use cases um like uh and you know and i think those use cases exist uh like payments i think is an amazing use case you know banking the unbanked um bringing real world assets on chain like maker is trying to do is is an amazing use case i don't think you know I don't, I don't think MEV is required for any of those things. You might need it to secure blockchains, but I'm hopeful that somebody will figure out yeah. how to secure blockchains without that. I think like, I think Cosmos is doing that, right? Like, I don't think, I don't think you have to have MEV. Um, I think there's, if you're, I just think, you know, I am not a blockchain engineer, so I don't, I don't understand the details of this stuff. Um, but if the if MEV is the only way to really monetize uh, uh, blockchains, then I, I think crypto is in trouble. Yeah. Why is front running a bad thing? That's a tricky question. That's kind of like why is inflation bad? Like you know, it's like you never not something I've I've ever <laughs> thought about. It's just bad. Well, uh, inflation's bad because it makes uh, people who don't have assets uh, it makes their prices of everything higher, so then they have less money. And they get angry. Well, same, same for, same for crypto. Like if you know, if I get front run every time that I trade a crypto, then that that makes you know dealing in crypto more expensive than it than it otherwise would be. Um, so yeah, I think it's just it's just uh, you know inflating the expense of of using blockchains and DeFi apps and stuff, and uh, you know that's making it more expensive for users and more profitable for the uh, you know miners and validators, which is not what we need. You know, we need more users. We need we need miners and validators too, um, but you know, ultimately we need users. Yeah. Two more takes I want to get your thoughts on. Um, one was uh, Zero X Homs, which I really like this guy. Um, I don't know who he is, but he said some really good well, takes on Twitter recently. He's anonymous. You're not supposed to know who he is. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> I, maybe it's not a he. Maybe it's a she. Uh, yes. Or neither. Um, crypto needs, uh, they tweeted out, crypto needs $102 billion of retail inflows to keep stabilizing the market cap. Um, can you explain this to me? Why, like how he got here and, and do you agree with it or disagree with it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, I, I'm sure that that $102 billion number is not correct because it's just, you know, a very rough approximation. Uh, but I think it's directionally correct. Uh, you know, the, the easiest way to think about it is just to, to think about Bitcoin, right? Like there is, uh, 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 you know, the miners all have dollar denominated costs, right? Like they have to pay taxes and they have to buy GPUs and whatever, whatever. Uh, and the way they pay for all that stuff is they sell the Bitcoin that gets issued to them. So there is a steady outflow of Bitcoin, right? There's a, there are structural sellers of, of Bitcoin. Uh, uh, and for the price of Bitcoin to go up, the there has to be new buyers coming in that are larger than the, the structural sellers, right? So you're, as an owner of Bitcoin, you're totally dependent on uh, new buyers coming in. 
that is not the case in equities, right? Like equities as a whole generate cash. They, you know, they pay dividends, um, they buy back stock. Uh, so whatever that is, you know, five or six percent a year, whatever, um, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the number is, depending on the state of the economy and stuff, that is a tailwind for equities. So all things being equal, you know, if the buyers and the new buyers and the new sellers uh, balance out, you would expect equities to go up five or six percent a year because equities generate cash. It's the opposite in Bitcoin. You know, if they're if the natural buyers and sellers even out, you would expect it go, to go down to the degree that the, the, the miners have to sell Bitcoin. Right. Um, and I think that is true for the whole of crypto. Like there are just not very many profitable um, uh, blockchains or uh, protocols in in crypto. Uh, I don't think there are any profitable L1s, like maybe ETH post merge, but not ETH right now. And I think there are very few profitable um, um, protocols. Uh, one that I'm aware of is MakerDAO. Um, uh, I think Yearn always had been, but I had even read an article at one point that they were uh, they were loss making in the first couple of the years, uh, first couple months of this year, which is, you know, because they protocols have real expenses, like they have to pay devs and right. they have to uh, and they have to pay for the merch that they give away for free, a permission list and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, the way that they pay for that is by uh, is by using the their own tokens that they issued to themselves. So it kind of looks like they don't have expenses because they're just paying for them with, you know, pre-issued tokens. Um, but those tokens get sold. So that's like, you know, just the same way that miners are always selling um, Bitcoin to pay for their expenses. Protocols are always selling their own tokens to pay for their expenses. So that's, you know, that's a that's a headwind uh, for crypto as a whole. Uh, which is the opposite of equities. You know, equities has a tailwind from cash generation, and and uh, and crypto has a, a headwind from from the emissions. Whether it's 102 billion or not, I have no idea. But that's you know directionally, I think it's correct. Does this tie back into your earlier earlier comment that crypto is not an investable asset class yet? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Um, so you're you're very like, you know, if you just think about the price of Bitcoin. So if I think about the price of a stock. I can think about its earnings and then I can think about what multiple those earnings should get. And then I can decide, like, you know, should it be higher or lower than here? But if you're thinking about Bitcoin, you're just thinking about the price. Like, you know, and when people make when people talk about like, oh, you know, I don't think it's going lower than 20,000. That's because like the last time it peaked to 20,000 or whatever, you know, it's just some your your price prediction is some derivative of price, which is yeah. circular. Right. Um, so in that way, and which is totally great for trading, uh, but it just it's not really for investing, I don't think. Yeah. But isn't all that you're saying here just that um, these aren't cash flow generating things and that they need more cash coming in to keep the business alive, which is just like what venture capital is? Um, yes. Which, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Which is, well, yeah, it definitely. It definitely could change. It could be totally different. Like it doesn't seem like that bad of a thing. It just seems like no. we're at the stage of the industry where this is a venture backed venture backed industry and not a cash flow generating industry like how a lot of tech was for the last yeah. 15 years. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I think you could you could I, but I, I it's just like for me it's just like how I try to conceptualize it. Um so for me it's kind of like if I'm thinking about buying a token it's I sort of think about like it's kind of like buying it at the Series B raise with the intention of selling it at the Series C raise, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's very much and very much more venture capital than listed equities. Anything else you're looking at these days, Byron? Luna two. <laughs> no, I do. I do have some. I do have some weird things trapped on Luna one that I need to figure out how to get out. <laughs> I, I don't have too much of an opinion on Luna two. Anything else that you're uh, paying to attention to, either in uh, crypto or in just like broader global macro markets? I guess stable coins are. I always think stable coins are interesting. Um, uh, and I, yesterday's note was about uh, about Tether, uh, which I went. In, I like started to look at Tether a little bit more deeply, ex ex um, expecting to come out with a very you know a very bearish take. Uh, that this is, you know, a Ponzi or, or whatever, but I, I actually had the opposite. I actually think that um, it's kind of good for crypto because I think people are, you know, if you look at, uh, if you look at their end of March financials, uh, they had like, 
they had like $160 million of equity, which is basically nothing. Um, and they had 6%, a 6% allocation to, to crypto. Um, and if you like haircut that by 30% or whatever Bitcoin's, whatever Bitcoin has done, they're probably, they're probably have negative equity of like 1.5 billion now. Which, you know, if a money market fund in TradFi had negative equity of 1.5 billion, it would be a race for the exits, right? And crypto, it's not bothered, you know, it's not bothering anybody. You know, Tether is still happily trading at, at $1. And the TradFi take on that would be crypto people don't understand finance and they don't know what they're doing. Um, and that was kind of the take I was expecting to have when I went to it. But as I thought about it a little bit more, I think like people probably know that and they're just not very bothered. Like they, I would assume that people think that Tether is going to do the right thing and they're going to divert the earnings from the fund back into uh, into the reserves until they get back to being fully collateralized. Um, and, you know, crypto having just survived UST going to zero, they probably don't care very much whether Tether is worth exactly one dollar or 97 cents, like 97 cents to a crypto person sounds like a dollar, just round it up to a dollar, uh, which is great. I think that makes crypto, you know, more anti-fragile and less panic prone than, than TradFi. So I, I, you know, I went into Tether expecting to be to, to be, you know, come out uh, skeptical. And I actually was actually the opposite. I actually think it was I actually came out with a, with a pretty positive take. Yeah. Um, they the size of USD. Uh, USDT redemptions over the last two weeks, I think it was ten billion dollars. That's a lot. 10, of yeah, I mean it. Uh, that rivals the size of the largest banking withdrawals in history, which is uh, oh, really? <laughs> quite yeah, quite a large amount. Um, on the other really? hand, they were uh, Tether was very, very excited and very. Uh, they're they're you know they're really kind of pushing that they were um, able to handle withdrawals of like twelve percent of their deposits in a week, which isn't that impressive of a thing? Uh, banks see outflows of 12% of their deposits in a week all the time. Though I guess the counter argument to that is that that's generally matched by corresponding uh, inflows. Yeah, I, mean, I think they, yeah, you can look at it different ways. Like, you know, let's just say if, uh, you know, Tether was actually only worth 90 cents, then uh, they could just, you know, the first 90% of withdrawals would get 100% of their money and then the last 10% would get zero. So, you know, the fact, the fact <laughs> that they're... The fact that they are uh, processing uh, redemptions is great, and that means it's not a total fraud, but, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, mean that you're going to get all of your money back. I think you will. Like, I think if you know, if if uh, there's, there's a funny line in uh, in Tether's documents where, like, you know, it lists all the risks, and the last risk that they uh, that they list is we could abscond with the reserve funds, <laughs> which I thought is very, which I thought was very amusing. Uh, but if they were going to do that, they wouldn't have done it already. Like they weren't going to hang, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have waited. So I, I personally trust Tether to do the right thing, but just You're because optimistic they're optimistic on Tether right now. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, but just because they're processing a lot of uh, redemptions does not necessarily mean that all is copacetic. It's kind of, yeah. that's kind of like the take that, uh, um, like Luna was our Lehman moment and we survived it, which I think is a terrible take. Uh, you know, Luna is not systemically relevant to the world. The problem with uh, with Lehman was that it had $600 billion of real world assets. You know, that, uh, Luna did not have that. It had $40 billion of mostly paper gains, fake assets. Uh, uh, so I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think, yeah, I, I do think it was admirable that, uh, you know, Crypto just sailed through that without without anything really happening. Um, but uh, you know, to say I think there was that one there was that one fellow that was tweeted about uh, uh, Luna not needing a government bailout. Like that's a pretty low bar. <laughs> like you were yeah. setting the bar for crypto really low. That's like you know congratulating yourself for not having a gin and tonic before noon. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> um, it's the line of the episode, Byron. It's a good place to end it. Uh, congratulating <laughs> yourself that you didn't need a, a government bailout is like having congratulating yourself that you didn't have a gin and tonic before noon. It's a good way to end it. Uh, Byron, <laughs> this was great as always. If you guys aren't subscribed to the Blockworks newsletter, uh, you should go read Byron's pieces. He's got some spicy takes. Uh, and Byron, hope you enjoyed the, uh, the rest of the week, my friend. Thanks. This was fun. Thanks.